one. Hey, Miguel Arati back here on the CRP, and I got my Wrestling Insider Snake Eyes joining me, and uh, we put him on the road this weekend. He's been in Chicago, and uh, he went to All Elite Wrestling. He saw All Elite Wrestling, and now he's here to tell us about the All Out pay-per-view. Uh, overall, it seems to be getting good reviews, but let's get uh, right into the nitty-gritty on it. First of all, uh, crowd experience, all that sort of stuff. How was the live show? Um, well, we were in uh, section 117, which is the first balcony seating. Um, it was a good view. Uh, the fireworks scared the crap out of me every time because I haven't been to a wrestling show with Pyro in a long time. Um, I did, however, get my homeboy to give me his tickets to floor seats for the last two matches and wow it was very very loud on the floor so i can only imagine what it was like in the middle of the ring where everybody's screaming at you but overall it it was a very energetic show um i think um there was probably 17 times as many tattoos in the crowd as there would be in a wwe show so it kind of shows that it's the subculture that is really helping fuel the, the all elite revolution. Um, it, it was good. I, I, I had a blast. It was one of the, it was probably better than any WWE show I've ever been to. Well, I mean, the fact for, from, a, you know, as a marker, as a, you know, just a fan that didn't get to go to the show and watching it. I mean, all elite wrestling still is new and it, they have that buzz, right? They, they haven't fucked anything up, you know, for lack of a better word to, you know, to the point where they've been, you know, turning people off. You, you know how the uh, the WWE has their ups and downs over the years and stuff. But we don't have a history, so there's still a feel good show, and that's good. I don't think they're going to have too many more of those because I think at some point the scrutiny and the heat and the criticisms will be turned up. And uh, you know, perhaps this is the time to start. This is all out, which uh, you know, in we are one month away from them being on television on a weekly basis. And uh, this was their final show uh, before that. So it's like, you know, it's supposed to be a showcase for some of that stuff. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, it's arguable. I don't think they did an A-plus job. I think that there were a couple of little holes here and there that we can talk about. And we'll see how bad they are. O overall, though, uh, at the live field, were you getting the announcements? Uh, you know, at the live event, uh, did, did, did it come across that on November 27th would be the next uh uh, TV taping in Chicago that on November 9th they would be in Baltimore taping another pay-per-view um, that sort of stuff uh, did that uh, was that clear to the people live or, or should I fill people in on this year no it, it was clear to the people um, that were in the arena they played basically the same advertisements over too many screens that were on each side of the entryway um, they basically showed the live feed on that so in case for a lot of the times people were standing. So you, either you were tall enough to see or you had to look at the screen. But um, yeah, it, it, uh, it was good. All right, so let's get right into it. They did the big pre-show right before the actual pay-per-view. Uh, what was the pay-per-view cost in the United States? I'm uh, overseas, so uh, I, I wasn't privy to that. What, what, did you happen to catch what people were paying for it? I, I think... I think it was either 40 or 50. I'm I'm not 100% positive. Considering I went, I okay. actually didn't have to uh, worry okay. about the price for once. <laughs> that, and, you know, in a way, uh, that's good, although I bet you spent more money on the road than you did at home. But uh, So uh, we'll get right into the pre-fight. I mean, put it this way. Uh, one of the things we talked about was the feel-good nature of the AEW stone. I think part of the thing is that captured that is that, you know, it really was the kind of thing that you could have spent like three, four days in Chicago and just immersed yourself in wrestling uh, around this show. You know, they had the Starcade and, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, the pre-show, uh, definitely important stuff for the future, definitely important stuff for the very first TV show because they led off with the Women's Battle Royal. Uh, the Women's Battle Royal, the winner was going to be uh, challenging on the first week of the TV show for the women's title. So uh, definitely a lot of aftermath and a lot to talk about in the Women's Battle Royal. Really fast, 21 women. Uh, they came out in groups of five with one wild card. The first group was uh, Shalandra Royal, Leva Bates, uh, Fabi Apache, Priscilla uh, Kelly, Penelope Ford, and I'm sorry, uh, and uh, Nyla Rose. 
The second group was Penelope Ford, Shazza McKenzie, uh, uh, Sadie Gibbs, Big Swole, Britt Baker. The third group was Tennille Dashwood, Eva Lease, B. Priestley, Brandy Rhodes, and Awesome Kong. The final group was Ali, Nicole Savoy, Teal Piper, ODB, and Jazz. And the wild card was Mercedes Martinez. And uh, overall, we had talked about it beforehand and, you know, tossing out names like AJ and things like that. You know, those, I think, were, were kind of pipe dreams, you know. Although, you know, she's out there and available and uh, sort of in her prime. Uh, that, that was really something that was just in my head, really. It wasn't out there, although the CM Punk tie-in is, is obvious, right? But there was the hope that maybe the Impact Wrestling, specifically someone like, uh, you know, uh, Tessa Blanchard was going to be on here. And I think uh, that they pulled in, you know, getting 21 ladies, they pulled in a good mix from across the board. But I, I, did they lack star, star power in your, in your eyes? Um, I, I think so. I mean, there was a lot more indie-ish lady wrestlers on or in that match. Um, I think they should add ODB as the Joker. Um, I think that would. I think she was the most over, other than um, Teal Piper. I think um, those two were probably the most over women of that match. Uh, with Britt Britt Baker as a close third, um, it kind of seemed like at times there there was maybe a little production issue. I think after the second group, there was like a thirty second pause before any music or anything hit. I don't know how it came across on TV, but. Um, it was definitely noticeable in the arena because everybody was kind of looking around like, uh, okay, where are they? <laughs> but um, overall, I, it did lack a little star power, but I think the star power that was in it, like Jazz, uh, ODB, um, Priscilla, uh, Priscilla Kelly, um, you know, feel, uh, and with the debut of Teal Piper, I think I think overall they, they booked it right. They, they did a good job. They introduced some new names and brought back some old names that I, want, I don't want to say forgotten because nobody's really forgotten. But, you know, people that haven't been on the mainstream for a while. And a lot of us actually didn't expect ODB because she does have a meat truck and her food truck was not at the pre-party with all the other food trucks. So we actually didn't think ODB was going to be in the Battle Royal. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, I, I was, I'm a big ODB fan from her work with uh, Impact is what I saw. Her. You know, go back about four or five years ago. Uh, when she was working with the Gail Kims of the world and things like that. Now, I would like to have seen like like that if if, if uh, Impact had truly allowed you know their roster to come through. You could have put like a Gail Kim and a Tessa Blanchard in there instead of some of the more independent names, some of the girls that maybe didn't get a spotlight in the in the in, in the match. You know, uh, for for more star power. But overall, you know, I think the business is the business. I think we can talk all we want as fans. Hey, AJ would be great, but. When it comes down to negotiating and getting it to the final table, you know, AEW, uh, I, I think that's where the goodwill ends. You know what I mean? It's like uh, at some point it's like, yeah, sure, I want to wrestle for it. I want to change the world and stuff. But, you know, if they come and say, hey, you know, CM Punk, why, uh, we want you to do us a little bit of a favor because we're new. I, you know, he's not they, – they're not going to get any favors done when it comes down to the negotiating ta table too. So we'll see how the roster continues to develop. There were definitely some tie-ins and things – that were announced throughout the show and some a uh, couple of signings that came up that we'll talk about there. But uh, overall, give me a grade for the women's uh, battle royal. Um, I'm gonna give it like a C minus. I mean, there were a couple of um, fun spots in there uh, with uh, Leva Bates walking on the books, uh, getting back into the ring. I thought that was pretty pretty funny because I mean, technically her feet did not touch the ground; they're touching the books. So. Um, uh, it, it was good. I think everybody had a little bit of shine. Everybody kind of got over. Um, the crowd seemed very pleased with it. I I didn't expect Nyla Rose to win it, um, but uh, we'll see. We'll see where this goes on the first night of TV. Well, and to get you know, it, it makes sense now in total retrospect because you know Riho won the the match to provide her opponent, and uh, so basically you know she gets to maybe avenge. Uh, you know, against the girl that pinned her in the last fight. And uh, the bottom line is, is if Rio goes up 2-0 and against her, you know, that's quite a, a push and a pop uh, for her at the beginning of the career, too. So, you know, I, I don't think that they can go go wrong in, in booking a rematch there. They don't, they have got a limited body of work, right? So 
So taking advantage of that uh, is probably the way to go. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Riho had another good performance, but we'll get to that one later. Uh, the second uh, fight on the after uh, on the uh, uh, pre-fight party, rather the pre-fight uh, show, uh, involved Private Party uh, taking on uh, Angelico and Jack Evans and uh, Private Party. Uh, you know, it was hard to see them losing in, in, in any of the uh, you know pre-fight scenarios, only because they're going to be featured against the Young Bucks, uh, you know, in one of the inaugural uh, TV shows also or, or, or something like that for one of the titles. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody thought uh, Private Party was going to win. Jack uh, Evans and Angelico, we've seen them before here uh, with AEW, and, uh, you know, they're all for the uh, for the appearances so far. So, Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a pretty athletic match. Um, it, the crowd seemed really into Private Party. Um, Jack Evans is fun to watch in person. Uh, the dude's, that dude's so, so good. I mean, I, I, I gave him praise on the, I believe it was the pre-show that we did, um, with our predictions and stuff. I, I said that, you know, since wrestling society, X, Jack Evans is always bring. So, but overall, I'm, I'm going to give that match about a B minus. Um, there were a couple of times where it kind of seemed to stall just a little bit or um, a couple of moves were, were just landed slappily, but that's just the worker in me judging like I always do. Um, I'm just not as bitter. <laughs> that's as okay. Hornets. But um, yeah, it was a fun <laughs> match. I, I definitely uh, I dug it. Um, yeah, Private Party was not going to lose that match. They're going to be the first match against the Young Bucks on the first episode of TV, so they definitely were not going to go in with a, a losing record. Yep. Uh, let me ask you a quick question here, because I agree. Now, I, I uh, you know, I'm not as familiar, obviously, with many of the indie fighters and stuff like that. Now, I, I agree with you on Jack Evans. I thought that, you know, it showed here that, you know, he's a pro. And um, uh, but Angelico didn't you know, put it this way. He didn't get over with me. Is, am I wrong on him? Is he a couple low or did he just not get a good chance to shine this, this uh, past show? I don't. I just thought he had the right chance to shine. Um, this match was definitely heavily more toward private party getting over and showcasing what they can do in the ring to the audience before the first episode of TV. Okay, and that makes sense. And you know, Angelica hopefully will get to show what he does. He kind of looked like a decrepit uh, Orange Cassidy there for a minute. It's like, what's going on here? And uh, again, just uh, me unfamiliar with the character, so I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but. Uh, uh, they may need to rewind that and give him another shot because he kind of looks, you know, like eclectic, interesting, like, you know, channeling a 21st century version of, you know, gorgeous George, exotic Adrian Street, you know, kind of like that weird character, even the Cody Rhodes characters from uh, from WWE kind of thing. So uh, hopefully he'll get another shot. But then uh, we went right into the pay-per-view show and they opened with a big fight. They opened uh, with Pac against Kenny Omega, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, was that the first match on pay per view. Yeah, yeah, that was the I first one that, that we caught second. on the pay per view. Am I missing one? What am I missing? I don't know. I I just feel like that was the second one on the pay per view. Um, God. I, was there uh, I, I I hope I'm not wrong, but I'm pretty confident that it was the first one. And then after that, they went into Jimmy Havoc and the three man match. But uh, let's go ahead and let's talk about Pac and Omega since I set it up anyway, even if I'm wrong. And, uh, you know, here's a situation where, you know, when you know the, the business and, 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 and you have to kind of wonder there, you know, you can't go into this one as a complete mark. But, you know, when Moxley goes out, and they're forced to get a, a late replacement like Pac. You know, Pac hasn't lost. I think I think he did just lose his belt, but he had a long winning streak and stuff. And that's kind of, you know, those winning streaks are kind of what the bread and butter of the indie circuit is. You know, can you – are you in such a position where you can go into a new town and still, you know, be asked to win, you know, asked to win and stuff like that. So I think it's all very interesting. But could Pac have said, sure, I'll save your show, but I'm not taking a loss to Omega? Could that be part of the negotiations? Does that come up, or does the creative come up afterwards? Uh, I, uh, 
that's a hard it's a hard it's a hard choice to make because I wasn't in the room, but um, I think I think Pac probably took this on as okay, you know, we screwed up for all in. It's a year later, you know, I'll do all out, and then we'll talk from there. Obviously, with the all out post show, uh, if anybody caught that, Pac did interrupt Hangman's um, speech after his match, and they basically are setting up for a Pac versus Hangman feud uh, going into TV. And I think that's exciting because, you know, uh, it means that they're going to, that Pac, you know, didn't come aboard just for one show, you know, for one thing or save the day. They, they, you know, whatever that future agreement is, is that they've come through and, and come with it, you know. Um, I think Pac uh, works really well as a heel. And, uh, you know, I think that there is something about the Indies and there is something maybe that AEW was able to capture there. That I, and I don't know what it is, but his attitude in the ring, or you know, the character, the bastard, that whole thing, he just seems more edgy than he was in uh, WWE. The WWE has this weird way of presenting a guy where it's like, hey, look, look at this freak show. He put him on the top rope and he does flips, and that's all they gave you with that. You know, there wasn't more character development or, or, or anything with him, you know, and he was really, you know. His in-ring stuff is fantastic too, you know. But like you said, maybe he gets stale if all he's doing is is the red. Uh, I forget exactly. I don't want to. Uh, the red arrow, I think they call it, is his finishing move. You know, he did it, and I think that that that's the message AEW said in this fight is that he didn't use his signature move to finish his fight. Yeah, I was actually going to bring up that point. And before I forget, because I am tired and it's been a very long 48 hours of watching wrestling and traveling in my car, um, SCU versus Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, and uh, Marco Stunt was the opening match. Didn't even have to Google that. I, I was thinking all – I was listening to you and I was thinking at the same time. But, yes, um, I, I did How like the I fact forget? that – that Pac uh, finished with a submission hold that basically just put Kenny Omega out. Um, the entire crowd was taken aback because that was not the ending they were expecting, obviously with Pac not doing the red arrow. And e even the crowd was, at, we were actually kind of confused when Kenny Omega's music after the opening match. But there's Kenny Omega's second. And then Austin he came out. I don't know how it came off on TV, but I mean, the first 30 seconds of his theme song, everybody was silent because we just thought it was good. Um, the match was good. Um, no matter for the first time, my independence was awesome. I know they botched, uh, I think it was like a reverse piranha at one point in the match, but that's really the only thing that I saw that they messed up on. Um, again, I was catching it live. I didn't catch any of the replays or anything. I was trying to watch the arena and stuff like this. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, that match, that's a solid B-plus for me. That was um, that was one of those matches that had me go, coming in and out of my seat for sure. Now, and when you mentioned it, obviously, uh, in the post-fight, uh, uh, you know, I guess they called it a post-fight uh, interview or a post-fight part, you know. It really wasn't much of a delivery post-fight on the line. But one, one of the things they did do is they brought out Adam Page, and Adam Page was facing the media – and Pac sort of confronted him, and after that confrontation was done, uh, Adam Page sort of walked off, and, and that ended the media session. So, uh, like I said, the delivery that I saw maybe was incomplete, uh, but it was kind of strange. But Pac is set up for the Adam Page feud now, and Adam Page is going to need a bounce back too now, you know, to get uh, over the, the, the loss. You know, um, the last couple of days of promos for Adam Page – they really did turn it into, uh, you know, an emotional point in his career where, you know, he was saying things like, I have to win, you know, that, you know, the, the earnestness of that. So they're, they're, they're going to need something good to, to, to give him a bounce back on. But what's not clear here is what do they do with Omega now? I mean, like, what's going on? I mean, I, I, is it Omega against Moxley? You know, when Moxley comes back, but then, you know, then Omega runs really the risk of an, yet another loss and then, you know, how many times can you roll out the, you know, the magic boy and, and have him not do his magic and people keep thinking he's good? You know, I mean, I, it's like, I don't know. I, I thought I thought Omega kind of took a backseat for the company in this one. I, I, 
Is that my weird impression? It might just weigh off, or, or does Omega have a long bounce back? I think eventually he's going to bounce back, but I think, I honestly think what they're going for is Omega's not going to win. And eventually he's going to have to turn heel. And I don't know if you've ever seen Kenny Omega's heel work over in New Japan, but he is, he is one vicious heel. And I think that's what they're going to do with Kenny Omega. Out of the elite, he'll be the first person to turn heel on TV. Bet. I'll bet the bank on that one. I will go all in on that prediction. Okay. And that's, uh, you know, obviously with the background that you have on Omega knowing his work in New Japan and stuff, that he spent time as a heel and, that it, you know, that you, he was over, at least with, with you, you know, I mean, uh, that could definitely be something that they do, do need to explore. And it'll be very interesting then because then I do think it sets up, you know, do, do you get Omega versus Cody at some point? You know, how, how far away are we from, from that type of stuff when we're really getting into that? Because right now they seem to be, you know, looking to put the AEW guys against other guys, you know. Um, at any rate, so uh, that match clocked in in about 23 minutes. Did you expect it to go longer? How do you how do you feel about that? Because, like, the WWE really rarely does matches that long anymore, you know, uh, especially on TV, the product that we often see. So uh, 23 minutes, was that about right for that fight? It did come with a surprise ending, which I think was uh, – a good, a good, it was a good surprise, you know, even though Omega's got a lot of questions, you know, it was a good surprise because, you know, I don't think people, you know, now they've got to put Omega back on it. Go ahead, tell me, 23 minutes, too long, too short, how do you feel about the work? I, I think it was the right amount of time. Um, they definitely, Pac definitely worked on an amazing heel side, like I said he was going to do. Um, like I said, none of us really expected Kenny Omega to pass out from a submission hold. I mean, that, that definitely took everybody off guard. Um, I mean, the show did run, it seemed like it ran about three and a half hours. I, I want to say it, it seemed like it did run long, but I'm assuming that's the time they bought on pay-per-view. So I guess with the extra half hour, I, I don't I think almost every match went about 20 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes, depending on the time limit. I think almost everything went almost to time limits. Okay. But, um, uh, we'll go through. Maybe I got some numbers listed wrong here. But okay, so that's that to me uh, puts the pack and Omega fight uh, in the rearview mirror here. Let's go ahead and go back and clean up my mess and uh, talk the, uh, the dinosaur team against uh, the SCU team. And I, I think uh, overall the message here is a good message, uh, which is we can have our fun, but at the end of the day, the pros are the pros. You know what I mean? And I and I think it was telling, you know, we've had the conversation again, not trying to put the guy down, especially because it's obvious he works hard, but Marco Stump may not be somebody that, you know, that you can put on TV every single week. I think you, you got to notice he's the guy who took the pin too, no? And that stuff's meaningful, don't you think? Well, and if anybody in that team is going to take the pin, I would rather have it be Marco Stunt. You want to protect Jungle Boy. Obviously, you don't want Luchasaurus going down. So, I, you know, obviously Marco Stunt's going to be the fall guy for that team. But as long as they keep doing uh, six-man tag matches the way that they worked with SCU, where they worked as if, you know, they were a transformer machine. I mean, they were – they worked as a nice, well-oiled machine. I mean, he threw Marco Stunt at – you know, one of the SCU guys, and he did a hurricanrana, and it's little things like that that are going to get the crowd to react, and that's that's what you're going for. You're going for a crowd reaction, and uh, not to veer too far off, but a little fun story. The night beforehand, I went to Game Changer Wrestling, and we saw Marco Stunt walking around, and then we saw another guy that kind of looked like Marco Stunt, but he had facial hair, and obviously, I've said before, I'm not a big Marco Stunt knowledgeable human, so... I went and took my picture with this guy who I thought was Marco Stunt. It turns out it was his brother, Logan Stunt, who's also a wrestler, who took one of the most insane bumps of the weekend that wasn't AEW related. But maybe we'll do a podcast on the Game Changer Wrestling Show, too. But just thought it was funny that I made the biggest rookie mistake of taking a picture with Marco Stunt's brother thinking it was Marco Stunt. (laughs) Well... And, you know, I think, too, it's good to know there's two of them, too. And you don't want to, you know, you don't want to get scared and see them together and not know. (laughs) 
So well, uh, what do you think of the fight? Marco, it's literally Marco okay. Stunt, but with facial hair and brown hair and not red hair. It's 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 weird, man. It it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> so now overall, I, what, what did you think? The, I was I don't want to say disappointed in the fight, but like I I thought that uh, Luchasaurus's hot spot could have come could have been a little longer. I, I felt like they didn't give him that. Uh, much of a, a chance to shine, um, and uh, again, the Marco stunt gimmick. You know, now now that we've seen that, you know, uh, how deep is is his toolbox of, 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 of skills? You know, size wise, he's always going to be at a disadvantage. He can only wrestle a certain way anyway. Um, but again, you know, uh, the the Fortnite dance and stuff like that. You know, will get old quick. I think. So hopefully, uh, you know, there's more uh, tricks up his sleeve there. And Jungle Boy, I think, he, you know, Jungle Boy, none of that applies to him. The guy's excellent in the ring. I think you're right. They should protect him, keep him in there. Um, and, uh, you know, per the weigh-ins, I don't know if the weigh-ins were faked or not, but he weighed in right around 150 pounds. So I think that's small for a pro wrestler. But, um, you know, it's uh, – you know, he's weirdly not small in the same way as Marco Stunt is. You know what I mean? He's, uh, he's longer and lankier and stuff. And I think he will work on a weekly basis, week in and week out as a wrestler. So it's a fine line in there. Yeah, I agree. And he's he's more toned, that, and that's what makes him stand out other than the Marco Stunt body type. Um, and that's not ripping on Marco Stunt. He's just a small human being. I know what, I know the struggle. I know what it's like. But um, <laughs> Jungle Boy's got that look. I mean, he's got the big hair. I mean, he looks like his dad. And, I mean, if, if they put him in front of the camera, he's going to draw that teenage female demographic all day, guaranteed. Yeah. So, now, let's get on to, uh, you know, something that you may want to lock your teenage girls up and have them not see. <laughs> and that's uh, the uh, Jimmy Havoc, Joey Janela, and Darby Allen match. And I'm not putting any of the guys down for charisma, but this was definitely an R-rated fight. Um, you know, and again, I know that on the indie scenes, you know, this was definitely something that's a PG thing. You know what I mean? This was light compared to what goes on there. But I think this is about the level that you're going to be able to portray, especially now once we get on to TNT and stuff like that. And also, um, you know, with these guys, uh, you know, hopefully with the wrestling chops they have, you see them in wrestling opportunities and stuff where they don't have to bleed or staple themselves or or, or do gimmicks like that. Um, overall, though, what you think? What you think of the bumps? I <laughs> this is the this is the one match I was definitely looking forward to, and um, it it definitely delivered. Uh, that Darby Allen with the thumbtack skateboard from from where I was sitting, we couldn't tell that it was thumbtacked on the bottom. We just knew there was something on the bottom, and then I saw it on the screen that it was tacks. And I don't know how it looked in Janela's back after that, but it looked pretty pretty gruesome live. Um, I, I thought the spots were good. I thought. They took their time. They didn't rush anything. Um, it didn't seem like they really messed much up. Um, I'm that's probably one of my favorite matches of the night. So that one's definitely going to get a B plus grade for me. Although Janela, yeah, yeah, yeah I, yeah. I was I was waiting for the for the Snake Eyes appearance. I, I was sitting there. I told my my little boy I was watching it with. I was like, watch this. <laughs> nothing happened, dude. <laughs> if I wasn't in the belt, uh, if I had floor seats, I probably I would have. I would have. <laughs> but uh, all kidding aside, though, uh, on the television, the Janelle uh, thumbtack thing, it came across uh, pretty shockingly, especially if you're not you know aware of the thumbtack level of stuff on wrestling. Only because uh, he got delivered, he got dropped there. And then in a spot about five minutes later, Janelle had been outside the ring and he was crawling back in and it was a real close-up camera shot of him getting in the ring on his back real tight. And he still had probably about eight or nine thumbtacks in him five minutes after the spot. So you know how that goes. But I think for the average person, they were like, whoa. You know, uh, There was also uh, an excellent Janelle moment, I thought. And I don't know if this you caught live, right? But uh, – he was sort of sitting in the chair, and I think it was Havoc that uh, monkey flipped him while he was in the chair, and he kind of landed 
perfectly well sitting in the chair and he kind of had a moment with the crowd where he crossed his legs and, and signaled to him and stuff like that. And that really came across really well on TV because, it, you know, it's 10 shit what they're doing. There's, you know, they're, you know, there's really no room for laughter. And then when it happens so kind of naturally, it just was, it shows how pro, pro those guys are, you know? And to be honest with you, um, I think that that became a pecking order fight. I'm, I may be wrong, but from what I can tell, it looks like Havoc's probably the most battle-tested out of all of them. Janela has his own level of insanity, and, and, you know, it's hard to call him second there. But I think Havoc may have the longer resume, maybe been around longer and stuff like that. And I think maybe that's what they were taking their hat off to. And Darby Allen, you know, uh, the kid, that kid – he doesn't even need to win to, to get over. And I think he did it again this time, you know. So um, he's safe for now. Janela, he was worried, you know, the, that brawl they had building this fight up before him, Janela was worried about not being in the W column and stuff like that. And I think that that could be Janela's continuing story. It'll be an interesting thing. And I don't want to see him keep losing, right? But, uh, you know, either way, I think this match was, you know, was definitely a, uh, an eye-opener. And all three guys – you know, they can, they can fight in AEW all day as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, I, I completely agree. And I was just thinking in my head when Darby Allen did the uh, off and drop at the barrel outside that, uh, man, that was, that was insane. Where he took the top rope straight back onto the steps with the cracker barrel on his back. <clears throat> oh, dude. <laughs> it's, it's funny, I, I you know, you know, first of all, my hat's off to Cracker Barrel because, uh, you know, they're at every stop in America. You know, I don't I don't know how big they are as a corporation compared to McDonald's or not, but they're a big mainstream name. And if they back, especially an extreme fight like that, my hat's off to them. Maybe, you know, some 21st century executives with some forward thinking there. But with that in mind, I couldn't help but thinking there must have been, you know, those companies, you know, I picture the boardroom with like 10 or 12 guys, you know, or 12, 12 people making a decision. Or, you know, are we going to back this wrestling stuff? You know, some of those board members were not happy. <laughs> you know? We're using the crab no, around. Maybe. But overall, overall, though, I do think, um, you know, hats off to their support that they, they, they should probably keep doing it because um, there's nothing in that match that uh, – you know, that was that much of a turnoff. It is a little bit extreme for your mainstream people, but I do think it carries over and those guys do it really well. So uh, enough about that fight, although uh, we were uh, excited about that one beforehand and, and it matched. Love Give it a grade. You said B+. Plus? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, B+, plus on that one. Next, uh, we go on to the tag team action. And this is one that, if I'm not mistaken – and uh, I don't mean to call you out on your shit, but I think you got the prediction wrong. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking about best friends taking on the Dark Order, and we've had best friends get over it with a W on the last uh, outing that they had. The Dark Order, I, if I'm not mistaken, they've done some run-ins, but we had not seen them in an official match yet. So we were expecting to get a, a best friends push, and I agree with you. Um, but what we got was actually maybe better. And uh, what we got there was the save from their new friend. And uh, I'll let you take it from there. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first <laughs> off, I, I did miss uh, the first half of this match. The food and merch lines were ridiculous when the doors opened. So I figured if, if there was one match that I was going to miss, at least half of, it had to be this one. Just, I mean – order of elimination no offense to anybody in that match it's just that's that's the best time to go um but when i did get back i sat down i sat back down i seen the ending and when the lights went off i saw the jeans I, that's all i saw was the jeans glimmering off of a <laughs> camera so i had to whip out my phone real quick because my boy my boy orange cassidy made that save baby made that save Oh, that I, I got to meet him the night before All Out uh, at the Game Changer Wrestling Show. And uh, the shirt's actually an extra large. I wear normally a large, but there was no larges left. So I am swimming in an Orange Cassidy shirt, but it is freshly squeezed and it feels phenomenal. So that's all that matters to me. And I got a good selfie with, with Orange Cassidy. So my, my night was made before 
all out even happened. But having Orange Cassidy make an appearance, hands in pockets, flying through the ropes and getting back in the ring and then hugging it out. It, I even said it up in the balcony. I said, give him a freshly squeeze, put him in the middle. And, squeeze. and that's what they did. They hugged it out right in the middle. So that was that was cool. I, I enjoyed it. That's good. A little directing from the uh, from the uh, from the good seats there. That's not bad. Get in on the action now. Now let, let's talk. Let's spend a minute on Orange Cassidy here. Now, I you know of all the indie guys, you know, a, the, and I'll be honest. With you, the first time I saw him was uh, when he was just destroying Tommy Dreamer <laughs> in in the uh, in the. Uh, uh, battle royal that the men had there and uh you know from there it's like you gotta you, you gotta you gotta look you know so i go out onto youtube and basically he's got a lot of fights and he does have a, a good fan support right now like, you could probably see I, i've seen at least 10 or 15 different matches of orange Cassidy, and the gimmick is is pretty much a stock gimmick you don't get too much difference in there He's got the orange juice. The orange juice helps him out later in the fight when he drinks. He doesn't want to take his sunglasses off. The hand in the pocket sequence. Sometimes, you know, he does the slow, you know, rolling in the middle of the ring while the guy goes back and forth on the ropes and things like that. But then in a couple of the cases, and it may have even been with Joey Janela. I, I get my matches confused, but I think, you know, when he gets serious, the guy can outrest. He can wrestle, you know. So... How are they going to do this? What 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 is the end game here? At what point? He's he, I mean, put it this way: everything we've seen so far, and the guy, you know, the guy's got the right delivery, temperament, and everything like that. So I, I can't, you know, unless you're bitter ass Jim Cornette, I can't believe that he's not getting, you know, a, a smile out of most people. You know what I mean? But where is he six months down the line? Because he can't come out doing the same shit, you know. Week in, week out. How, how you tell me how you would uh, book Orange Cassidy? <laughs> I would keep the sloth gimmick, and I would eventually have another comedy wrestler, maybe slip him energy drink instead of orange juice, and all of a sudden we get the more wrestling side of Orange Cassidy that brings out the the non sloth gimmick of Orange Cassidy. Um, the I, I got to see him work against Gangrel the night before All Out, and that <laughs> Gangrel. What's Gangrel like? Cassidy so man. for people who don't know Gangrel, what's Gangrel like? I get, I, I, is he known? Is he a uh, what's that gimmick? Gangrel is the vampire leader of the Brood from the nineties. It was him and Edge and Christian, and then the second reincarnation was Gangrel and the Hardy Boys. Uh, back in the attitude, I got you. So I mean, pretty well known. I mean, he he he, okay, yep. uh, he was definitely one of the driving factors in the Monday Night Wars. But uh, yeah, they he worked in Orange Cassidy. It, it was pretty funny. And Orange Cassidy accidentally drank uh, Gangrel's blood instead of the orange juice, and <laughs> it was pretty funny. It was good. It was a good. It was a good match. He he can definitely work when he needs to, but. He can also be a very, very funny and witty comedian character too. So I mean, you have a two-dimensional character there. Just wait till you finally get that third dimension of seeing him actually work, you know, an actual style. So I think, I think you have a long-term story there. Um, like I said, I would put another comedian wrestler in there and eventually slip him some energy drink, and then we finally get Orange Cassidy, who's upbeat and ready to go, and blah 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 blah, blah like ADD Dave here, and. You know, just be on a roll. I think I think that would be a cool conclusion to the freshly squeezed saga. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, like I said, you do get enough in his independent works uh, that you can tell the guy. I mean, the guy has some chops. You know what I mean? So it's like at some point, you know, size isn't going to matter so much with this roster and stuff like that. He could go right into some matches with you know some some of these other guys and stuff like that, and and become a regular rotation player and put this stuff back in history. And I think. That's kind of the way it has to be. Like I said, the character really does, you know, if if in three years he's expecting you and me to pop the same way for, you know, a couple of light leg kicks at the beginning of the fight, in three, you know, in three years, if you've, you've seen it 30 times, 
it isn't going to pop the same way. So, but he's got the chat. Hopefully, he evolves because I think he can. I think he shows glimpses of it in his in-ring work. So uh, he made the appearance and the same there for the best friends, and, and that was uh, another one of the highlight moments. That's probably the highlight of that fight. Not not to put the Dark Order or best friends down, but at this point, right in the middle of the show and stuff like that. Uh, I think they did need the uh, freshly squeezed uh, punch of energy there. Next up, Riho versus Hikaru Shida. Rio may be my favorite wrestler of all time. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think AEW has done a real good job of presenting her. I think, you know, they realize what they have there is, um, like you said, just somebody who's going to get attention, a notice, you know, a noticeable character and stuff like that. Um, they, they, you know, bring up the fact that she spent more than half her life, uh, you know, working and she's only 22 years old, 13 years of ring experience and stuff like that. And I think it shows in the little things that, you know, especially if you're familiar with uh, the Japanese culture and things like that. I think, I think, yeah, I think you're looking at um, the other thing that I, I think admirable about her is I don't think she's a great natural athlete. I think what you see there is a lot of her ability, you know, her putting in the work, so to speak. And I think you got a real gifted pro there. And at 22, uh, she's something special to watch. I enjoy watching everything she does. Sometimes the women are always a little more sloppy than the men, and you can criticize there. But why? Why bother? I mean, the girl's ninety pounds, and she's just, and you know, she's she puts every ounce of it in, into what she does in the ring, and it shows. And her opponent here, I think, you know, I think AEW is onto something again here. If if they're going to take the Japanese workers and bring them here to feature them, I think they're going to get eye popping ex- matches and experiences. You know, only because those those guys, and you know, the women also, but the, the, the Japanese wrestler in general is used to wrestling their whole career in Japan, never leaving, never, you know, being part of that scene. To them, it must be very special. Hey, I get to wrestle, in, you know, in the States. That, that rarely happens. This goes across MMA, boxing, and all the sports. They're very insular over there. So they must definitely be riding high and feeling pretty good. I think it showed the ring. I don't know. This is one of my favorite matches on the card. How did it come across live? Rio is so light. It don't matter how hard she bumps in that ring. That ring does not make a sound. Okay. I don't know how it came across on TV. I like, I'm sure they have it mic'd up or whatever, but I mean, that girl took so many moves and I kind of questioned if she ever landed on the ring at all. Cause I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't hear it. I don't maybe, know what happened. Maybe she floats. <laughs> she, but yeah, she's she's definitely a very talented worker. And I mean, you you did hit the nail on the head when you said you know the Japanese wrestlers do really live that culture. I mean, most of those when they're training, they live in the dojo, they clean in the dojo, they they cook at the dojo, they train that they don't leave that dojo, and it's their it's their responsibility to keep it clean and to train and be up on time and still do everything that's needed to be done. Um, in that one area, I mean, they don't really ever leave that dojo except to do shows. But um, yeah, I, this is probably one of my favorite um, favorite matches of the night as well, non gimmick wise, I should say. Um, I'm definitely gonna give this one like a B, a solid B. Um, I feel I feel like it could have been a little better. Um, it just seems like Riho needs to sell just a little bit more. It seems like she took a really crazy beating and towards the end there, it just seemed like nothing happened throughout that match. Um, but otherwise it was, it was a solid match. I, I think the women did a, did a hell of a job. And uh, well, that sets up is it like we talked about earlier, Rio versus Nyla Rose. And that's, uh, you know, for what it's worth, it's sort of a rematch uh, compelling because uh, Rio does own a pin over Nyla Rose and uh you know, I think that's important to focus on. Um, it, we, we will see how that match goes and how she can manage it. You know, uh, a fighter more than double her weight uh, without a second person there, you know, to help distract and things like that. Uh, we'll see. I think I think she'll she'll come through with flying calls. I, I predict that she'll probably win. Um, and uh, I'll base that a little bit on, on some of the wins and losses we've seen here. I think AEW is trying – maybe in their storytelling here to maybe, you know, surprise with some of the winners. The Pac uh, Omega uh, win is a uh, uh, one possible, you know, one example of that. And also in many ways, the uh, final match between Jericho and Adam Page, because only because 
they did a good job of convincing you that Paige did have a chance, you know. So uh, my hat's off to him. But I think hopefully Rio will get the job done. She'll be the first champion uh, for the AEW on the women's side and make things interesting. Now we get into real nitty gritty stuff. Cody Rhodes and uh, AEW. I think they're making a mistake. I don't like just calling him Cody. I, I like the Cody Rhodes, and, and they're kind of forgetting the name. So I'm going to insist on calling him Cody Rhodes here. And uh, he took on a rival, Sean Spears. Uh, this rivalry was well documented uh, on the internet. It pulls in Tully Blanchard, and obviously with Cody, you know, it's one of the top faces on the AEW uh, roster here. How, how do you think about this fight? I, first. I didn't expect it to have a definitive ending this time. I did expect some of the interference and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think up until now, you know, it's funny because it's like uh, MJF and Dust and uh, Cody, rather. It's been MJF telling you he's my best friend, he's my best friend, he's my best friend. Cody really hasn't, you know, returned that love to him, not, at least not to the extent that, you know, it, it's sort of been a one-way thing, right? So when he acknowledged him and said, yeah, I want him in my corner, I think that solidified a lot and, and helped him, uh, you know, that character a good deal. Because, you know, if he was delusional about his friendship there, and then you kind of wonder if he's, you know, if he's all there and stuff like that, and he's way off on that, uh, it, it would have had a bad effect on him. So I think that that, cleaned up that one little question for me. And I think that that was important. Uh, it gives MJF uh, real legitimacy. But, um, you know, he wasn't the right choice, not against Tully. Not the way, you know, not the way they played that man out. Why don't you tell us how that felt in the ring? And so what, just to watch Tully Blanchard work again, uh, you know, he, he avoided having a huge gut and stuff like that. He still looks, he still looks pretty good. And God, he was a son of a bitch when he's fucking resting. God, he, was a, he really was, you know, one of the best heels that if I had to go back and think about it, you know, from the old days when I was a kid and stuff, he really was one of the best heels. And I think, uh, you know, he's actually playing a better heel than Sean Spears here. All right, you take it away. I'm sorry. I talked too much. <laughs> No, but, I mean, how good was Tully Blanchard as a manager, though? I mean, he really – Tully Blanchard hasn't been seen on wrestling in, like, 30 years. Where the hell has Tully Blanchard been? Like, this guy pulled that off. I mean, there was a part where um, Sean Spear had Cody's weight belt and Earl Hebner over there, you know, scouring Sean Spear, you know, give me that belt, give me that belt, and – Tully sneaks up behind him, takes off his own belt, and hands it behind Sean Spears' back. I mean, that son of a bitch. You know? I yeah. mean, how good is Tully Blanchard? And he even took bumps. I mean, the guy took bumps. I mean, yeah. I was I was very impressed. That, and, and this is this is where one of the big, uh, biggest criticisms of the night came from, actually, was um, Cody's pyro was set off right in front of Pharaoh, which is his dog. And a mm -hmm. lot of animal advocates are not very happy today with AEW setting off pyro within like 15 feet of this dog. So um, I guess that's something they're definitely going to have to keep an eye on. And Tony Khan even said in an interview that it was a mistake that it happened. And, you know, they're going to make sure something like that doesn't happen again, which, you know, it, it could have been an honest mistake or at the same time, you know, maybe they just didn't expect Pharaoh to freak out when fireworks went off. But honestly, this is probably the non gimmick <laughs> match of the night. Um, I, this this was a solid. I, I'm gonna give it a solid A minus. Um, actually no, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with an A. I mean, with with Arn and everything else. I mean, it it was good. Everybody expected MJF to turn on Cody, and it didn't happen. So they didn't go with the, I guess our program WWE story writing minds. So um, definitely, I'm gonna give it an A. I I like this match a lot. Yeah, I think now you know the uh. Tully and Arn Anderson, you know, come, kind of come front and center and could be their own storyline now. Now, I'm not suggesting that they should do any, you know, real ring time or inter if they were to say, well, they're going to do a match and even that in a legend sort of fashion, that's so wrong. That would not be the right way to go. But pitting them against, you know, each other as stable, uh, you know, as uh people controlling uh, opposing stables and, and create some type of 
uh, you know, whatever the rivalry, but, you know, whatever uh, storyline was to, to describe it, I think that, that would be a very interesting way to go. And like you said, Arn and Tully, I mean, that's two of the four horsemen, you know. So you are talking about legendary wrestlers now. So uh, Arn, uh, let's just say Arn didn't uh, stay in shape the way Tully did. <laughs> No, definitely not. But then again, when you're just working backstage for WWE, I'm sure you get pretty comfortable in your retirement days. So I don't I don't blame our he's been doing, but he as long as he keeps doing that, I think we're gonna see that guy for another twenty years yet. That guy looks so good. I couldn't believe it. Yep, yeah. But is the Sean Spears Cody Cody Rhodes story over at this point? Because I mean we we had a definitive ending. Um uh, you know. Cody may, you know, it may be the right thing. You know, Cody's kind of think, you know, when he when he gets named VP, you kind of think, okay, he's gonna get the belt, you know. And he they've been kind of booking it not that way, where he's not in the title picture and stuff. But I think that's inevitable at some point, right? You would think so. I mean, he um, that was a pretty definitive finish. I mean, even with the Arn Anderson thing, I guess you could honestly kind of drag it out yet because there's you know, uh, history there with him and Tully. So now you can drag that into it. So now you got the the guy who probably knows Tully Blanchard better than anybody. And then you have Tully Blanchard who knows Cody's dad better than anybody. Where does Dustin Rose come in to play? So maybe that's something to look forward to. Or maybe MJF turns on Cody and then that's when Dustin comes in. So now we have MJF and Sean Spears against Cody and Dustin. Yeah, I mean, honestly, Dustin was the natural choice, I thought, to play Cody Rhodes' corner man, you know. Yeah, we were actually more expecting EDP to be uh, chosen as a corner man. So we continue on down the card. Are you going in and out on me here, or can you hear me? I can. Okay, so uh, there you came back a little bit strong. So let's go ahead and go right into the Lucha Brothers versus the Young Bucks. And, uh, you know, uh, this was a co-main event. You know, uh, any way you slice it, they wanted to present it on par with the main event. Uh, they don't want the tag team wrestling to get a backseat to them. Uh, I think this was uh, a solid showcase. I think this is another... Uh, match where um you know uh how many people thought the young bucks were gonna win this one you know what i mean i think i think it was with them being presence of the company and this that, the other thing i think they were probably would have been favored heading into the fight and i think the natural thought was for them to go ahead and get the win that the lucha brothers were able to pull off the win there and stuff i think means to me, that their creators trying to be different, at least at this point, they're trying to surprise. Uh, were you surprised by this one? Did this one catch you by surprise? Uh, I was kind of 50 50 booking it in my head. Um, okay. I could have I could have seen them go over, but at the same time, with them starting TV, I don't see why they would put the AAA tag titles on the Young Bucks. Um, having it on the Lucha Brothers, they're they're still gonna be working their AAA, which means they won't be working every TV episode. So, I mean, they're going to have a lighter AEW schedule. But I think having them go over also definitely solidifies them as maybe the only threat the Young Bucks have right now. So, down the road, we're going to get one more Lucha Brothers Young Bucks match, and it's going to be the one that's the, the cream of the crop, basically, I think. And that's that's probably going to be like a two out of three fall style tag match or something like that. Uh, it's going to be probably a main event on, on a pay-per-view. Um, this well, match, though, I... Yeah, I Go ahead, I'm sorry. This match was the first. Uh, this is when I finally got tickets to the floor seat. So I, I got to see my favorite tag team from about eight rows back on the floor for a ladder match. And needless to say, I think I sat in my seat for maybe a minute total of that match, and that was it. Otherwise, I was I was up out of my seat that whole match. Every man, the, the Lucha Brothers are so good, and the Young Bucks are so good, and like it just the the energy in that place. I mean that. It was that was a big fight atmosphere. If if any of the matches had a big fight atmosphere, that one took the cake. Well, uh, let me ask you a question here. 
Now, in terms of uh, the wrestling scene, and you please correct me if I'm wrong. You're you're my insider for a reason, man. You got to clean me up. But uh, the the ladder match has a certain position. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you don't just ladder match. You know, you got to have been through a lot of matches and kind of like get to a pecking order, you know, where it's like, all right, you know, we've done certain. What, what's beyond a ladder match? Is it the cage match? You know, uh, it, it, could we see a tag team cage match? And then I thought a blast from the past. I don't know. Um, you're probably too young to have seen them live, but I don't know if you remember the old Starcade scaffolding matches. Oh yes, oh, the old NWA scaffolding matches. I, I I remember those from the seventies with Jim Cornette. Didn't he fall off the scaffold too? Wasn't that one of them? You, you got me there. So no, maybe, maybe they bring the WCW Triple Cage back. That would be kind of interesting yep. to see. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of, you know, with, with the his, them acknowledging the history, there are a lot of uh, gimmicks there. And, and like I said, the, the fact is, is, in my head, you know, once you get to the ladder matches, you, you know, you, you're already at the, uh, in, you know, a hardcore feud. You know what I mean? It's like you don't just do ladder matches. You know, you got to get there. And uh, they let off with that here. So how do you one up that? And the scaffolding matches, were, you know, were, were ones from the past that, that came to mind here. Um, and, uh, and that fight was all – exactly. I was going to talk about the appearance of the Boricuas uh, in that one. And uh, LAX – talk about LAX for those people who don't know them. Uh, Santana and Ortiz, uh, obviously on the indie circuit, uh, they're a pretty big thing, but uh, – why don't you fill some people in who, who may not be familiar with it? Well, they they are the, from my knowledge anyway, the second incarnation of the LAX gimmick. Um, obviously, Homicide 187 is not with them um, as they are on Impact Wrestling, I believe. But um, yeah, two stellar, two stellar guys, uh, quick in the ring, super stiff. Um, they make they make everything look like it hurts, and they're two guys that really live their gimmick, and it comes off very believable on television. Um, it was kind of funny that they came out with American president masks on. I I thought that was pretty funny. Um, I actually didn't know who it was until they hit their finisher on uh, one of the members of the Young Bucks, and then that's when it kind of led me to believe that it was LAX, and then obviously unmasked, and LAX is now in AEW. And that's good. Uh, you mentioned it before um, that they kind of have to keep the Lucha Brothers around because, you know, they don't have somebody built up to fight the Young Bucks yet. Now, is, is this LAX the type of group that they could get there with them? I mean, that's probably where they're heading. Or, or do they have enough heat and hype now that they can go right into that feud? Well, maybe they interfere in the uh, the Bucks private party match on the first episode of TV, and that sets up the Bucks versus LAX. I mean, the Bucks do have a reason to technically lash back. I mean, they did get attacked after the match by by LAX, but um, I, I see LAX more of the they're gonna be like the DOA and Los Bariquas of AEW. Where they're gonna be that gang mentality where they're gonna attack more people backstage. I think to get set up into their feuds. Okay. And uh, definitely the tag team division, you know, adding LAX was one of the things they hyped on the, on the broadcast as, you know, another feather in the cap of, of what they're calling the strongest tag team division already out there. Um, you know, uh, talent wise with the WWE, I don't know because the WWE has got, you know, pros and veterans and teams and stuff like that, but just for emphasis in their placement on the card, and in, in the treatment of, you know, the Young Bucks as, you know, uh, in, in all the hype and stuff like that, I think they are doing the right thing for the tag teams. I think the tag team, you know, it adds one player, but it adds, like, more than one dimension. It really does add add to the fight when done well. And I think, uh, you know, it, it, it is a good place to go at the WWE right on their weak point. Oh, 100%. And, 
now here we get into the main event. The main event, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I may have approximate times, but this one clocked in at just over 26 minutes. And uh, you had Chris Jericho uh, getting the win over uh, Adam Page. Uh, he used a sort of an elbow finisher. Uh, I think he's calling it the Judas effect or the Judas kiss or one of those, something like that. Um, which, like I said, uh, you know, is, gave, gave Jericho the title there at the end. Um, very hard fought fight. Uh, Jericho bled. Uh, um, you know, Paige, I think, did show that, you know, for 26 minutes on the stage, I don't think he did have a, too much of a weak moment where you just, uh, you know, or whatever. I think what you mentioned where uh, that his game was ready, that all he needed the attention. I think you're right. I think, you know, uh, Jericho, I don't think, did him any favors either in terms of carrying him and stuff. I think Jericho came out, you know, and for what it is, I think he came out and really wanted to win. You know what I mean? So uh, he got a good version of Chris Jericho. This was my favorite match on the card besides the Reho match, only because I think this was uh, just, you know, no gimmicks. And I think, you know, gimmicks have a place and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if – you're a wrestling fan and, and, you know, you can't appreciate this fight. Then I don't know. I don't know, you know, what, what you're kind of watching. I, I, I enjoyed it. Am I wrong? How was the impression live, you know? And Jericho, what a, what a great heel. <laughs> well, and I got to say, too, after he won the belt, Jericho was legitimately tearing up. And we know that's not part of his character. So you know that last night actually meant a lot to Chris Jericho as a human. I mean, when he says he wants to change the universe, he wants to change the universe. Um, seeing Hangman Page come in, riding a horse, doing that cowboy shit, um, you know, and then Jericho's entrance with the with the pyro and the jacket, man, man, I could feel it. And the entire crowd was singing his theme song. I don't know if it was able to be heard over the TV broadcast, but everybody was singing his theme music. And it was... It was pretty intense. Um, it was a good mix of new school style wrestling with Adam Page, you know, hitting the the high spots, the moonsault to the outside and stuff. And it was a mix of Jericho's classic angering, you know, psychology work of beating the piss out of somebody and taunting and getting the crowd to hate him even more. Even though I don't, I don't think heels and faces are really going to be established until AEW is a weekly thing where we're used to seeing these people week in and week out. I think not, right now we're just cheering everybody because, you know, holy shit, it's Chris Jericho against Adam Page. Like, who the hell would have thought that would have happened? But um, mm -hmm. it, it, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the match when he kicked out of the first Judas effect. That I, I legitimately yeah. thought, okay, Adam Page is getting this. Here we go. You know, he's, he's going to win. And when Jericho hit that second one, very sneakily, I might add, with when Paige is going for that forearm, I mean, that was the perfect call for an ending to that match. And, you know, Jericho made a back elbow into a finish and made it credible last night by winning the world title with a back elbow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you can't really credit. Jericho really is, 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 is a, a landmark wrestler, like a generational guy, you know? And I think that this... You know, if you weren't ready to call him that before, and many people did already give him credit that way, I think last night really uh, earns him that, you know? Because, um, I mean, the bottom line is, is is you could take more money. You could go, you know, we could still be watching him talk about the list. You know, you know if Vince still likes the list, we'd still be, you know, with that corny gimmick. And he, he'd get it over. You know, he got that stupid list over. Can you believe, you know? Uh, so that, at the end of the day, was one of the reasons I thought that he would win. Uh, they did a good convincing job of bringing Paige along and, and giving him, you know, the hope, uh, you know, saying, you know, by tying in the cowboy shit, I think they did that real elegant. I think that that, you know, I went into the fight thinking, oh, you know, if Paige wins, it won't be like, ah, I knew it or anything like that. They did a good job. But at the end of the day, going on to TV, only one of these two guys is tested. Only one of these two guys you know has been there before. And I think that they did the, the right thing there. And I think it'll make it all the better when somebody else is actually able to dethrone uh, Jericho when it comes along there. 
Um, you know, it could still be Paige at some point down the line with the right, you know, way these goes. But yeah, I think overall, I think Jericho, you got to you got to abuse the, the last few years of his star power, and uh, you know, basically let him do what he wants. Well, and I hope AEW does it differently, where we don't see the champion defend the belt on TV ever. I want them to only defend it on pay-per-views on the big shows because then you do have to build a, you know, Chris Jericho is going to be a heel. So you're going to have to build a baby face that really has the crowds back. That's going to pay the pay-per-view money to see Chris Jericho get his ass kicked. I think it's a wise choice on having a heel champion where you have to have a baby face come from behind to try to get the belt off your very first champion. And, you know, who knows, maybe Chris Jericho holds it for you know nine months and solidifies it as, you know, this is the title to hold and you need to be the best in the world to to take it from whoever's ever got it. Um, I think uh, Jericho is the right guy to do that. He can work with damn near everybody. I mean, I've never seen him in a bad storyline. I mean, ever. Like you said, he got a list over. I mean, who else could get a list over? A clipboard. A clipboard with paper on it. He got over. But, um, yeah, I agree. It's, he's a, he's the perfect choice for the first uh, champion. I, although I did want to rip off my Hangman shirt that I was wearing it all out because I was a little mad. But I I figured that would probably be bad for everybody's uh, eyeballs. So I, I left it on. <laughs> Well, let me let me ask you this question in terms of, um, uh, you know, who is on the roster now that uh, becomes Jericho's next challenge? You know, technically, if they want to go with the win, what's going on with your sound? What happened? Oh, we good? Can you hear me? We good? No, there's good. Start over. Yep, go, okay. go from there. So if if they're going off of wins and losses and stats like they say they're going to, I technically believe Cody Rhodes is probably the front runner for a title shot. To be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you got Cody right now. But, uh, go beyond Cody. Who, who else? Because they, they, that's where we. I, I've been bringing it up, and you know, people. You know, we, we haven't been ready to knock them yet for it, but their roster is not fully flushed out. You know, they do need a couple of key pieces here and there. And then I think they need, you know, maybe 20 workers, you know, guys who come in and maybe in their career they're settled. And it's like, you know, either we're going to rejuvenate them or they come in and do the job that they've done. But, you know, maybe not in the title picture, but they need more people, you know. Now, um, in terms of star power, it, it depends. Is Jericho going to defend on that first pay-per-view? You know, because then they've got a month to build somebody up. How do you do that? You know, how do you do that with what they've got currently on the roster? You know, we still don't know what they're going to debut on TV, but this will bring us back full circle there in, in, into um, CM Punk. You know, if you if you had to bring somebody in from the outside, it still has to be somebody, you know, like a CM Punk that has the reputation that people are going to buy it. How do you look at a Punk versus Chris Jericho uh, sequence of matches? And also, maybe you can fill me in because I don't know. Did they work, uh, do a, a set uh, or more than one set with the WWE? Have they ever uh, done a, a, a rivalry? Uh, they did do one rivalry. Um, I want to say Punk was the champion at the time. They, they did have a match at WrestleMania, but even Punk has gone on to say that that match was nothing that it could have been because of injuries, and he just was kind of tired of the business at that point. Um, but it's only happened one other one time uh, with the rivalry, so I think it'd be something new. It'd be something fresh. Um, but at the same time, do you want to just bring somebody in and all of a sudden have a title match without any win-loss records? So that's where, again, if you're if you're looking down the scope of the roster, in my opinion, it would have to go Cody and then Pac. And man, I don't even know who the third I don't even know who the third person would be. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, again, you're in a situation there where the roster, you know, who can we count on too? Because we've seen a lot of people coming in, into the ring, especially they've done battle Royals and things like that. But you know, who's going to stay, who's going to be uh, on the feature list there. So what it looks like to me is Jericho, you know, may not 
defend on that November pay-per-view, or at least maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe you have him sitting there, you know, presiding over who's going to make it, you know, to, to challenge him, and he can play the arrogant champion like he does so well. So uh, that may be the best way out here. Uh, overall, what was the CM Punk buzz like at the show there? Was You know, obviously – Walking in, there was hope and things like that. He's from Chicago. Um, you know, was that there till the end? Uh, you know, I think, you know, there was, there was the hope that maybe Punk would insert himself into the final match, into the title picture. I mean, naturally, he'd be in the title picture, right? So so what was the overall buzz? And what were your expectations? What, what the, was the crowd? Was CM Punk on everybody's mind? There was a lot of CM Punk merchandise being worn. Uh, yesterday, especially at the um, the pre party for All Out, I, I definitely that's when I noticed more of the punk shirts being worn. Um, a lot of guys asked him during his autograph session if he was coming over to All Out, and he said, I'm getting on a plane with my gorgeous wife and I'm gonna hang out with my wife, and I guess that's what happened. So, no CM Punk. So, we the expectation was kind of low. Um, we thought maybe just AJ would debut like we had predicted on a different show, but that didn't happen either. So maybe punk and AJ just got on an airplane and went on vacation for a night after making a nice payday over at Starcast. Yeah. I mean, you, you, as a fan, you kind of wish these guys would get some of this stuff over with, you know what I mean? It's like, and it's like the thing that wrestling is a little bit different than boxing and MMA in that literally, you know, at this point, Punk's going to be 40, you know. So, in like, in those other sports, it'd be like, you know, what are you doing? You've just wasted five years of your life. But I think in wrestling, maybe five years is the right amount, you know. That's a lot of, you know, you, you, you don't see – you do see wrestlers at 50. Very few you see at 75. You know what I mean? None. Because there just does come a point where in five years – out of your working life, you you may live to regret it. Probably Punk won't. I mean, every, all the word is that he's, you know, smart with his money and, and, and he's going to be hurt in that way and stuff like that. But but you kind of feel gypped about not having him around for five years and what could have been, you know. And, uh, you know, if it's not going to happen, let's just make it definite. Stop being coy, you know. Just say, no, 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 I'm not coming back. And, w, and AEW can say, we're not negotiating, and then we can all move on. But if not, he's always going to be the elephant in the room. I, I think I think the uh, the CM Punk name will be circling around wrestling until he finally gives in, just to shut everybody up. I mean, maybe he just makes an appearance and says, look, I'm here, now shut up, and then walks out. And I, I guarantee you all of us fans would be happy with that. At least then we got, you know, a, something to remember him by, but instead of just walking out of a company – you know, at one of his highest points, you know, in a fan's eyes anyway. And it's yeah, I mean, I, and I mean, again, far be it for me to put someone down, but he's a guy that should want to put that UFC stuff behind him. You know what I mean? It didn't go his way. I respect him for having tried it. In, in fact, at his weight class and things, that makes a very big difference in that sport. You know, what he tried was virtually impossible. So, uh, just the fact that he tried it deserves respect, but he's not going to get any, you know? So the hope would be that he would say, okay, I'm going to move on real, you know, and put that behind me and then let it be forgotten. Like when Antonio Inoki fought Muhammad Ali, you know, they took him a while to forget about it, but they forgot about it. And that's kind of what you hope happens with Punk. But, uh, you know, this uh, has been our wrap up of AEW's all out pay-per-view. Any final words, any other surprises or anything that, that popped up that, that you want to mention on there? Overall, I give the show about a B. Um, you know, not um, uh, a bad show, not a show that I could say had any overt or blatant flaws, but there were such high expectations around it that maybe it fell short in, in my expectations in a little bit. That may have had some effect on it. And, uh, yeah, you, you know, overall, B, B plus a strong show, but uh, – how did you feel? Go ahead and wrap it up, Snake Eyes. I would give it a solid B plus. I mean, uh, from what I have heard, there was a couple of production issues at times um, that came across on TV. There was a couple of, like I said, the the little thirty second miscue during the battle royal and stuff like that. Those are the little things that, you know, after a couple of weeks of TV, they're gonna fine tune that. They're still in the learning phases. Um, 
but I, I think that just shows that, you know, there's room to improve and they're going to try to improve that. And who knows what happens after they improve that. And then they find something else. I mean, that we're going to really see here in the next about year to see how battle tested AEW really is to changing and adapting and learning the things they need to run a smooth production. And uh, yeah, we will see, you know, when, when you've got a monster like the WWE, you know, before you, uh, they're able to make moves that, you know, uh, such as, you know, all of a sudden announcing that NXT was going to be a, on on USA channel and be uh, right on television, not just on the WWE's network and stuff like that. Uh, they're facing a big foe. So uh, if you support AEW uh, and enjoy the fact that uh, WWE may be getting some competition, uh, go ahead and stick with them. Uh, I'm Miguel Arati, and that Snake Eyes are Wrestling Insider. We've been wrapping up the AEW's All Out pay-per-view. Uh, hit like and subscribe. Check out some of our old videos here. Snake Eyes and I have been going through WWE and AEW, and uh, we're probably going to expand into uh, getting a little bit more of a look on the indie scene so that uh, Snake Eyes can uh, educate me on all the stuff going on there. Uh, he went to a Game Changer Wrestling uh, show on Friday night and was impressed. So uh, we may be back uh, here on the CRP with a wrap up of uh, some real indie wrestling for the hardcores out there. Uh, final words go ahead and uh, hype your last uh, wrestling appearance or anything going on with you. And uh, if not, we'll wrap it up. I'm going to go and make love to my pillow and lay in my own bed after two days of being away from the comfiness and sleeping on a couch in a hotel. So um, we're definitely going to meet up. I'm, oh, maybe tomorrow we'll, we'll sit down. We'll talk some game changer wrestling. I'll, I'll knock some knowledge into you, like a light tube to the face. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. I always want to take a light tube to the face. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Snake Eyes, always uh, educational uh, when you join me here. And always a good time talking about AEW. I'm Miguel Arati, and that's Snake Eyes for the CRP.